Please join me in welcoming me, Dr. Tojo Palka. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. It's, was, it's been an interesting run, but I'll get into that. So let's just get started, shall we? My name is <laughs> Joe Palka. I'm a reporter for National Public Radio. Typically, when I give a talk, I try to do it without notes, in a relaxed manner, speaking off the cuff, as it were. It's a style that I've found works very well for me. But I've heard that using PowerPoint can help me communicate my ideas. Help me make my points more effectively. Help me engage my audience. <laughs> so I decided to give it a try. <laughs> what do you think so far? <laughs> okay, that's it for the PowerPoint. Um, it's... Uh, it's one of the few, you know, I work in radio, and so I don't get to play with these things. And when we switched at NPR about uh, 15 years ago from a proprietary piece of software, which was really atrocious, to a well-known piece of software, Windows, which was equally atrocious, um, they sent us to a training course. And for some reason, we're sitting in a room and being taught how to use Microsoft Paint. And we said, but we're radio reporters. <laughs> of course, they were, they were prescient because nobody knew the web was going to take over our lives at that point, but obviously it has. Well, Francisco, thank you. This is, this is my idea of, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a candy for me because, as I was explaining to Francisco at dinner, usually I sit in a room uh, by myself with a microphone and now that NPR's, you know, uh, cost-cutting measures have uh, kicked in in full speed, used to be one other person heard my things when I was recording, and that was the sound engineer who would register the levels. And, of course, this is someone who's doing this all day with different reporters all day and is bored to tears. So the trick in my book in terms of doing an interesting story was trying to get the engineer interested. Now that we've done these cost-cutting measures, um, we don't even have engineers anymore. I just sit by myself. And so nobody, as far as I'm concerned, hears my pieces. <laughs> I get no feedback whatsoever. Uh, occasionally, someone will call in to say, you don't understand the difference between Fahrenheit and centigrade, which I mistook once about 20 years ago, but this person hasn't forgotten. Um, <laughs> And, and so, you know, to have people who actually are not actively hostile and are interested in hearing what I have to say is, is, is a real treat. So I thank you all for coming to listen to me. Um, that, was, that was the silly part of that. The rest of, the, the rest of this evening I'm going to spend uh, talking a little bit about one of my favorite topics. That's me. My wife will tell you that. And, um, and a little bit about what I do and how I do it and why I do it and why I think it's important. And then I want to peel back the curtain a little bit about, about the nature of science broadcasting or science journalism and a little bit about how I do it. And um, I'm in this extremely envious position of being able to pretty much get anything on the air that I want to get on the air. Um, you, you'll hear from reporters that there's a lot of competition to get in the newspaper or in the, especially in television, and even at NPR there's competition to get in. At NPR, um, it depends on the time of year. If it's summertime, one of the editors of All Things Considered once said that if it had leader tape on it, which was the stuff that you put on the front of a piece when we were still doing reel-to-reel, -reel, if it had leader tape on it, he would run it <laughs> because things were so empty at that time of year. But, but it's, apart from the rare times when there's no news, whatever, or Washington has gone fishing for the time, um, I'm, I'm relatively lucky in what I get to cover, and so uh, I have a very – my view of the media world is fairly idiosyncratic, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. Um, just be aware that it's not typical. There is a lot of competition, and my industry is hurting big time, and 
it's newspapers have been smacked. Journalists, I, I just heard that U.S. News and World Report is no longer coming out weekly. They're going to a monthly version with a weekly online update. Um, uh, newspapers are either closing or merging or uh, shrinking their pages, their editorial content, laying off workers like crazy. Um, NPR is one of the few news organizations that's actually opening international bureaus. Everybody else is shutting them down. So it's a really, really bad time, um, but it's still a critically important industry. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm going to keep plugging along until hopefully not as long as Daniel Shore, because I think that's <laughs> – I mean, I salute the guy, and you know, but 90 is enough already. I hope I'm, <laughs> hope I'm off in a swimming pool someplace by then. Not underneath it, but okay. So, so yes, as Francisco said, I started off with the misguided notion that I could be a scientist. Um, I tried, uh, but it really wasn't for me. Uh, scientists have to be intelligent, they have to be driven, they have to be uh, directed, goal oriented, and they have to be willing to work on the same boring thing for years at a time. And I didn't, uh, I didn't have that uh, quality or those qualities. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing is, I, I mean, I, I have a shorter attention span than you need to have as a scientist. So, I was sitting around in my uh, f f penultimate year in graduate school, thinking, "Uh oh, <laughs> now what?" And uh, uh, I saw an, an advertisement in Science Magazine for a fellowship program where people who were going on a career in science could experience what the joys and miseries of, of journalism. To The idea being of the program was to say, well, look, it's important to communicate science to the public um, because the public is dealing with science all the time. And we need people, A, in the media who are good and, and understand what science is about, and B, we need people in the scientific world who understand what the media's needs are and can help uh, feed that beast. Because the media, everything you learn as a scientist, it took me like several years to unlearn um, and put back into a new kind of perspective. But anyway, I didn't know I was going to unlearn it then, so I went off to be a, uh, uh, this AAAS media fellow, and I spent the summer in Washington, D.C., and it was a revelation for me because, um, you know, when you're a graduate student and you want to find out something about DNA, um, you go to the library and you, you, know, you spend several hours looking through journals and books and things like that. And when you're a journalist and you want to know something about DNA, you call Jim Watson <laughs> and make him explain it to you. <laughs> and not that Watson's the greatest explainer, but that's the, the difference. You don't have to do any work. You get somebody who's already done the work to explain it to you. So I thought, well, that's good to begin with. And the other thing is that if you're a television journalist and you walk into the NIH with a television camera, it's like people are bowing and scraping and opening doors for you. And I thought, this is fantastic, you know, because I was a graduate student and on the dole and, and you know, making anything work at all was... So now they love me because I had a TV camera around. So I thought, well, that's a good way to get love. So I'll just try that for a while. And so I came back after my summer internship, and I finished my dissertation. And, and then I, um, I started looking for work in television. And I'm not going to bore you with the failures and missteps and what have you, but three years after I decided I wanted to work in television as a health and science producer, I was the health and science producer for the local CBS affiliate in Washington, D.C. And I thought, well, this is good. I'm, you know, I mean, you know, I set a goal for myself and, and um, I've achieved it. The only trouble was that I was the health and science producer for a local affiliate in CBS in Washington. And I don't know uh, if any of you have watched local news, um, but it's about the goofiest thing, <laughs> television news, it's about the goofiest thing going. Because you could say, I've got an interview coming up with, you know, this year's, all ten winners of this year's Nobel Prize. They're waiting for me in a room down, down, down in the Washington, D.C. And they say, look, we'd love to give you uh, a camera crew to go and talk to them, but there's a high school basketball game, and we, we don't have any crews. And you're kind of going, high school basketball game, top ten scientists in the world, high school basketball. And those were completely, there was, there was a balance there, you know. They were, and I couldn't. 
that was a crazy calculus that I couldn't cope with. And so I would have coped with it a lot longer, but I have, this is my advice for people who are thinking about changing careers, be sure to answer your phone, because one day my phone rang and it was the editor of Nature magazine asking me if I wanted a job. Now, I won't even go into the unlikeliness of that happening to any of you, but it happened to me, and so that's how I switched jobs from television to Nature. And then I worked at Science. And there I went from being a sort of the silly end of journalism to the almost the opposite extreme, which is this most serious end of journalism that you can get. And uh, I did that for a while, and then I was traded to Science Magazine for a future draft pick. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I, um, and then I, uh, I, I had, I had an experience, which I'm sure everybody has at some point in a job, where they're working for the largest jerk on the planet. And then you have to ask yourself the question: Do I want to power through this experience, and because the job is so great, or do I want to quit? And so I decided that even though science was a cool place to work and I liked what I was doing, I would quit. So I took a pay cut and, a, and left being the top writer at science for a temp job at NPR. And uh, <clears throat> things have worked out. Um, so what are the lessons that you have to learn in order to, to be an effective journalist? Well, um, I, first of all, I have... I have only the most uh, anecdotal evidence that I'm an effective journalist. Um, I've won prizes, so that means I get the, you know, the, this reinforcing bubble that I'm in keeps telling me I'm okay, so that's good. We may all be crazy. Um, and so I get, and I get a paycheck, so that's, you know, sort of that pragmatic evidence that you can do what you're supposed to do. But, but really there's not a lot of, not a lot of um, proof, and it's something that could be studied scientifically, but it isn't, which I always find just sort of amusing. I mean, I'm a science communicator, but I have no idea if I'm effective or not. But I do have some rules that I've, I've made up, and, and I follow them to the extent that I can, and it's helpful at least for winning prizes and getting asked to give talks, so I'll share them with you. Um, one of them, and this is really the most important, and it's something I did learn from television, um, is that when you only have 90 seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever short period of time it is to talk about the particular story you're working on, it really focuses your mind. Because you can't waffle around and say, well, I'm doing something that has to do with ecology, but there's also a branch of genetics in here. You have to get the story. You have to like zero in on what it is you're trying to say. And I think that's critically important. I think that if you can't describe your research or if someone can't describe his or her research to me in one or two sentences, declarative sentences, with no subordinate clauses, <laughs> they're not completely clear on what they're doing. Now, I confess that to get the nuance and the, and the scope of it, you need a lot more time, and I, I, that's not what we're talking about. But if you can't say to me, I'm trying to study how genes are, interact with the environment and affect behavior, right? Now, that doesn't tell me exactly what you're doing, but at least I've got genes, behavior, environment, and I did it in 10 seconds, right? Now, you build on that, of course, I get it, that's, that's, that's a given, but give me a break. Let's start with the core of what we're talking about. So my attitude is you should be able to tell your story to your editor, to your audience, to whoever, in one or two sentences. Because once you've done that, you know what you're trying to communicate. The rest of it is deciding what to include and what to exclude and what parts make it interesting and what parts can be left out and what you have to explain even though it's kind of complicated because you know people have to hear this because they don't have the background to understand the, whoops, the scope of, of what you're about to say. But I think it's critically important to really boil it down to one sentence. And I, I know a lot of my colleagues are, are, have trouble with this. Sometimes when we're working on longer pieces, and by longer I mean four, six, eight minute pieces, we also have to um, write what we call news spots. So every hour on NPR, the top of the hour, there's a newscast, and inside the newscast there are reports from, from reporters or correspondents. These reports are, they can't be more than a minute. They'll, they'll 
call you up and say, it's too long, cut it down if you make it more than a minute. And they're happy if your part only is 35 or 40 seconds. So a lot of times it helps to write the news spot first because you have to encapsulate exactly what it is you're trying to say. And then you can build on it. And the other part, which is also a rule of mine, is start at the beginning. <laughs> I know that sounds a little funny, but a lot of times you're in the middle of a story and you start, you start saying, oh, I've got this little thing and I want to put this together. And you wind up building something in the middle of your piece, but you don't know how, it's gonna, how you're going to get there. So almost always, almost always without exception, I, before I start to write my piece, I, I, I start with the very first sentence because radio is very linear. You, you cannot go back. You cannot backtrack. It's all going this way because once you heard it, it's gone. You can't open, go back to the first paragraph in the newspaper and say, oh, what was that about or who was that person? It's one pass and it's over. So you have to get very used to keeping it simple, keeping it linear. And if you start at the beginning and end at the end, your discipline is to keep going in one direction. So the first thing is know what you're trying to say. The second thing is know your audience. So let's do an experiment. I don't usually get to do this, so I'm indulging myself. How many people here have an advanced degree in some science or other? Okay. Well, you could self-define. I'm, we're not going <laughs> to... <it's> not <laughs> Nothing's riding on this. <laughs> okay. So how many people are don't think of themselves as scientifically trained at all, but they're interested in science. Okay. How many people would, you know, rather, you know, get a splinter <laughs> than hear a science story? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so this is not the right audience. I don't need you. You guys are already kept. I've already got you. You can all leave now. <laughs> no, what I'm trying to say is, in any talk, and, and I've experienced this in a lot of scientific talks, you talk, you go to the, you go to the, uh, the American Society for Human Genetics, and not just the American Society for Human Genetics, but the branch on um, population genetics, and not just the branch on population genetics, but the branch that uses molecular tools on population genetics, and you maybe get this room full of people, and you can go listen to the talk, and it's okay if me, as a reporter, doesn't have a clue what people are talking about, because they're not talking to me. That's okay. But I've been to other meetings where they say, we want to communicate to the public, and inside of 30 seconds, it's the same problem. They're talking in a way that you cannot make head or tail out of. So, for me, I have to make a judgment with every story I'm doing. I can't assume that people are interested. I can't assume any background knowledge. I can't assume, oh, I, I can't go very far. And just so you know that this is, you know, us poor science writers, think about the political coverage. The House of Representatives today voted to pass a bill that would uh, provide bailout money for car manufacturers. The House of Representatives is the lower house in a bicameral system of government. <laughs> the U.S. government is made of three segments. There's the legislative branch, which passes laws, the executive branch, which enforces those laws, and the legislative branch. I mean, come on, you know, we don't have to, we have to do that every time. Somehow you're expected to know about government. My other favorite example is try reading the sports page. Do you think they explain what a sacrifice squeeze is on the sports page? I don't think so. You either read the sports page because you want to, or you go someplace else in the newspaper. But there's not like, but we are expected to explain everything to people. And the other part is that if you do a story about melanoma, right? There's two people who are listening. There, well, there's two classes of people. Or as my, <laughs> as my favorite solipsism is, there's two kinds of people in the world: people who divide the world into two kinds of people, and people who don't. <laughs> So there's two kinds of people who listen to your story about melanoma. People who either have melanoma, know someone who has melanoma, have heard of melanoma, and people who don't know it. And they're listening very differently because one is like it's life and death and the other one is it's just another news story. So you're trying to satisfy a huge 
diversity of backgrounds, interest levels, what have you. And believe me, if anyone, if it was ever truer that you can't please all the people all the time, it's got to be in a situation like this. It's impossible. The other thing that happened to me as a science, former scientist, is I wanted to sound like I knew what scientists were talking about. I was, you know, I'm not stupid. I'm almost a scientist, you know. It helps to be stupid because the minute you start talking with scientists at their level, you start using their words. What does plasticity mean to most people? That means it's a property of plastic, right? It's bendable, right? What does it mean to neuroscientists? Something completely different. What does penetrance mean to a geneticist? Something very different than from a pornographer, right? <laughs> So you have to be careful that the words of the, that there are terms of art that you can drop yourself into. The other thing in terms of what I do, and this is part of the shtick part of what I do, is you have to capture people's attention. So in a way, the reason for doing that silly PowerPoint at the beginning is to engage you in some way. If you guys are bored from the get-go, I'm never going to get you to listen to any other thing I have to say. So I have to keep, I have to keep disinhi disinhibiting you, <laughs> to use a word from my, you know, my past, because, uh, because otherwise it's going to be a drone and you're going to tune out and I don't blame you. So it's constantly trying to grab people's attention. I mean, even asking you whether you had advanced degrees is a, is a part of an idea to engage you. I can't do that on the radio. But in this room, I can. So those are some of the tricks that I use. And then, of course, I pick a trivially easy story to tell, and, and that makes it easy, too. But I don't always. So what I thought I'd do now is play you a couple examples of the things that, um, that I've done. And uh, I realize as I pick the pieces that they're not the heavy lifting uh, <coughs> of science coverage. But, I mean, if you think about it, and this is another one of my dirty little secrets about science, cor science writing, science correspondence. There really isn't very much science news in a given year. There's a lot of science stories, and there's a ton of interesting science. But ask yourself in the last year, and maybe we can talk about this uh, after my talk is over, but ask yourself in the last year what science stories you've heard or know about that you haven't heard that you think my God, if we didn't talk about this, you know, it would be criminal. I mean, as you, you would be ashamed to call yourself a science writer if you didn't mention X. Now, just to give you the, where I set the bar, you know, when scientists announced that they had found HIV as the cause of AIDS, I think failing to mention that would have been a, would have been a mistake. But just to give you the flip side, a couple years ago, um, uh, Andy Fryer won the Nobel Prize for his discovery or help in his discovery of RNA interference. Now, I'm not going to try and explain RNA interference standing up here, not at this late hour. Um, but in the news, in the press release from the Nobel, everybody heard about it that day because everybody covers the Nobel Prizes. Why? Because they're the Nobel Prizes. It's not because it's science news. It's because it's the Nobel Prize. But those guys, the, the work that was done that won the prize was done years ago. So... When Andy Fire won the prize, the Nobel Prize Committee put out a press release and it said, you know, this work was elegantly described in a 2003 article in Science Magazine. Okay, so I get Science Magazine every week. I get it in advance of everybody so I can prepare thoughtful, clever news stories. So I went back and said, well, it's in Science Magazine and it was prize winning, Nobel Prize winning stuff in 2003. I wonder if I did a story about it. Uh-uh. Well, okay, maybe somebody else at NPR did a story about it. Uh-uh. There wasn't a single article in any media that I could find about that article in Science Magazine by Andy Fire about work that led to a Nobel Prize. So my argument about journalism is, if you want to know what stories I should have done this year, ask me five years from now <laughs> or ten years from now. Because most of the time, you don't know what's important yet. Nobody knows. I mean, things are maybe have more likelihood than others, but, you know, the paper that described PCR, how much attention did that get? Not much. But it turned out to have a major impact. See, and I just threw jargon at you. PCR, ha-ha. <laughs> Violated my own rule. Okay, 
So let's, oh, I had to put in that last spinny thing. I found that one on the airplane today. I thought that was fun. Okay. Let's, um, there's my little pointer. Um, let's listen to this. We're going to take a break from today's big story to bring you this item, which is about time. You'll have more time to celebrate New Year's Eve this year, but not much. The international body that's charged with keeping time on track has decreed that there will be a leap second added to the end of 2005. NPR's Joe Calvin explains why. The reason is there's time, and then there's time. Once upon a time, a second was defined as 1 86,400th of the time it took the Earth to make one revolution on its axis with respect to the sun. Astronomers liked that definition because it meant the sun was directly overhead at the same time every day, high noon. But some timekeepers don't care about things like stars and the rotation of the Earth. For them, time is, and always should be, a constant. The Earth's rotation is wobbling all over the place. Why, the rotation is affected by things like melting glaciers, El Nino, even the tides, they cry. So the constant time crowd likes what the 13th General Conference on Weights and Measures came up with for a reference in 1967. Namely, that a second is the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. Now there's a number you can hang your hat on. But this left everyone with a problem. The time based on hyperfine levels of cesium and the time based on Earth's rotation have a habit of slipping out of sync. Earth is rotating just the teeniest, tiniest bit slower than it used to. So every few years, the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service, aka La Service Internationale de la Rotation de la Terre et des Systèmes de Référence, <laughs> decrees that there will be a leap second to make up the difference. The last one was at the end of 1998, and the next one is at the end of this year. Enjoy it. Joe Palka, NPR News, Washington. Now, again, we're talking, that was two minutes, or two, I should have written the time now, but it, I think about all the, there was a lot of business in there, but what did, didn't, there was, you learned something, right? That there's two ways of looking at time, one's based on an atomic movement and the other's based on the rotation of the planet, and they, they get out of whack occasionally. I think that was all I was trying to say. And the rest of it was business. The rest of it was to keep your attention. I mean, I didn't have to say the exact number of hyperfine levels, you know, whatever that number was. Uh, all I was trying to do there was to, to keep you with me long enough to sit, not change the channel before that piece ended. That's my goal. And, it's, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. It's, it's not my goal to educate anybody because... If you walk out of this room and try to explain to somebody else what I said in that piece, you'll get a few steps down the path and then you'll realize, well, I don't really understand it. Because my friend George Johnson, the New York Times, I think has come up with the perfect um, description of it. It's the illusion of knowledge. <laughs> it's like for a few minutes you think you understand sidereal versus atomic time and then it's gone because you didn't spend enough time learning about it and I didn't spend enough time teaching you about it for you really to get it. But I just have to, I have to play this because I, this is like, this is, this is so great. Joe Pavel's story about the leap second that's coming at the end of the year brought this comment. I'm writing to congratulate you on a very clear presentation of the principles of atomic time and the need for leap seconds. This is a difficult topic, and your report handled it very well. That's from Judah Levine. He's with the Time and Frequency Division of the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. He continues, it's also very appropriate that you reported on this particular leap second because a number of groups have proposed making significant changes to the leap second system or perhaps abolishing leap seconds altogether. Because of this, it is quite possible that this coming leap second will be the last one for a long, long time. <laughs> Actually, some, I think I heard there's another one coming this year. But um, this is the other thing I want to show you about that story, just for those of you who think more in terms of print. Now, this is another one of those impossibly terrible slides. The, the idea is not for you to read the text, but to realize that's the entire story. 
Uh, I think I counted once. It's about 250. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, wow. I mean, that still blows me away. But that's it. That's the whole, that's every word I read. In fact, sometime I should just read this <laughs> and live instead of playing you the radio piece. But it's amazing um, what you can say. Now, it's not, again, it's not, it's not in depth, but there's a lot to be said there. Okay, um, I want to play one or two other pieces, and I'm trying to decide. Um, as you can see, I've <laughs> spinning egg, moray eels, polyan. I haven't ticked the high, the most complex topics for the science world. I'm kind of torn because um, I usually play spinning egg, and maybe I'll play that because um, it represents me being as stupid as possible. <laughs> Did it not work? This is all things considered. I mean, oh, and this is also I'm trying to wedge this two stories, stories together. I could have purchased more than a billion eggs. At least that's what we did last year. According to the American Egg Board, that's 50% more than the average for a week. But then this isn't just any week. Eggs feature prominently in the holidays of the Passover, which starts tonight, and Easter, which is Sunday. Eggs are also on scientists' minds this week in the current issue of the journal Nature. Researchers explain why a hard-boiled egg spun rapidly on a tabletop will flip upright and start spinning like a top. And here's Joe Palka has the story. As a practical matter, it's easy enough to show that if you set a hard-boiled egg on a table and give it a good spin, it will start off spinning horizontally, then start wobbling, and then start spinning up again. The hard part is explaining why it happens. I thought this would be an easy problem, but it turned out to be really very subtle and quite tricky. It took us a long time. Keith Moffat is director of the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge, England. He's drawn to problems involving spinning objects. Two years ago, he published an article in Nature about the physics of a coin spinning on a table. Now, as he said, the explanation for why an egg behaves the way it does is tricky. Moffat did his best to explain, without equations, what happens once the egg starts spinning. Its axis of symmetry will get a little bit inclined to the horizontal. And that means that this point of contact moves horizontally relative to the center of mass. Now, when that happens... If this is sounding complicated to you, and perhaps a little hard to grasp, I know how you feel. The rate of uh, what we call rate of precession of, of the axis of symmetry around the vertical. Are you still with me on this? <laughs> okay. Now, at the same... Actually, that was not exactly the truth. I was holding on for dear life. And it only got worse. Now, this is the tricky bit because um, there's a bit of math uh, involved that I think is just unavoidable. But it follows from this property that the height of the center of mass... But as Moffat talked, it did become a bit clearer. After the egg starts spinning horizontally, two forces, known as friction and slippage, combine to get the egg wobbling. As it starts wobbling, some of the horizontal spin gets transferred to vertical spin. And as that happens, the same forces that make a gyroscope spin on its end start making the egg spin on its end. The gyroscopic forces must exceed the natural effect of gravity, which is pulling the center of gravity down. All right, okay, now I'm getting there. Right, so, so in other words, as it begins to wobble on the table, it starts to appear more like a gyroscope, and at some point the gyroscopic forces take over and it does flip up on its axis. Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. That was close. Moffat says he's not done with spinning objects. He's thinking about working out the mathematics that explains why a raw egg spins poorly on a table. Another problem, he says, is obvious until you try to explain it. And maybe after that, an explanation of how an irregular object, like a pebble, spins on a table. For now, I'll stick with hard-boiled eggs. Joe Palka, NPR News, Washington. See, I, now, and if I mean... that wasn't enough egg spinning for you, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's more detail. <laughs> more on our website, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, that the intro is so pathetic. Americans are buying a lot of eggs. And Joe Palka has a story about it. <laughs>
You know, that's, that's what I mean about the difficulty of wedging science into a journalism format. It just... It, it, it. So, what happened there? Again, uh, I'm making fun a little bit of Keith Moffat's inability to explain this in an easy way, but I'm trying to point out that if you stick with it, you can sort of figure out what's going on. And it's an old trick that when somebody is doing a bad job of explaining something, as a reporter, you say to him, so what you're saying is blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, yes, that's exactly right. And you go, and you put that on the air. Um, okay, I think we're at a decision point here. Do you want to try one more? This one, did anybody hear this? This was last week. This was... I think, I think you should all listen to this just so you'll join me in mocking Michelle, uh, Michelle Norris for not being able to say paleontology. <laughs> because she talks about something that's the study of the governor of Alaska. But this is also... <laughs> so let's... World of turtle paleontology. Oh, we have to start that over. Whoops, start. Sorry, you have to hear the beginning. It's one of my favorite lines ever. Okay, bring the level up. There is stunning news. There is stunning news today from the world of turtle paleontology. Scientists are reporting they found a turtle on the half shell. Literally, it's a 220 million year old fossil found in China of a turtle that had a shell underneath its belly, but no shell on its back. As NPR's Joe Palco reports, this new discovery should help scientists answer a question that's puzzled both them and kids: How did the turtle? Can it shell? It's hard to overstate just how exciting the Chinese find is. It is probably the most important discovery concerning turtles for the past 40 or 50 years. Paleontologist <laughs> Eugene Gavin has spent his 40-year research career studying turtles. He's recently retired from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Until the Chinese fossil came along, he had introduced the world to the oldest turtle, a fossil found in Germany. That turtle looked like a turtle with a hard shell covering its back. But this specimen has sort of a halfway intermediate formed uh, turtle shell. In fact, the new find is known as Odontochelus semitestacea. Semitestacea means half shell. Olivier Riepel is with the Field Museum in Chicago. He's a co-author on the paper in the journal Nature describing the Chinese finding. He says the new fossil represents a kind of primitive turtle, one that hasn't quite figured out how to make the hard shell on top and bottom that modern turtles have. By studying this kind of intermediate step, scientists should learn more about how the turtle shell evolved. Now, Riepel says a hard shell is critical for a turtle planning to make a living on dry land. An animal like a turtle living on land will not be attacked from below, it will be attacked from above. But Riepel says a turtle living in the water can get by without a shell on top because swimming animals will typically be attacked from below. That's why Riepel and his colleagues in China believe this turtle has a marine origin. Riepel says another factor arguing in favor of a watery lifestyle is that the part of southwestern China where the fossil was found was a marine basin 230 million years ago. In addition to the half shell, the Chinese turtle has another remarkable feature. This turtle has teeth, which uh, modern turtles don't have, so that's a very primitive character of this fossil turtle. Modern turtles have a hard beak made of keratin instead of teeth. Now, it may seem odd that an animal that had managed to evolve something as clever as teeth would then unevolve them, but paleontologist Robert Rice says it isn't. Rice is at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Remember, birds do that too. Their ancestors had teeth, and birds eliminated their dentition and developed a similar structure to that of turtles, that they have that beak that they use very efficiently. And that's the great thing about paleontology, specialization. Someone has actually taken the time to compare the beaks of birds with the beaks of turtles. American Museum of Natural History's Gene Gaffney says you can get even more specialized than that. There have been a number of people that have devoted their careers to studying turtle ears and their physiology and function and so forth. The career opportunities abound. Joe Thompson, NPR News, Washington. So, so my, my wife 
thought I was being snarky, and a couple of people thought that too. And I wasn't being snarky. I just thought it was funny. Uh, the reason I uh, – well, these other things I'd love to play for you, and they're, they're bits of things that I like very much. The Maury Eel was – reminded me, actually, of this piece because at the start of the Maury Eel piece, the woman I talked to says – I said something like, you know, scientists can get very specialized in their work, in their work, and she says, I like to study things that are long and thin. <laughs> and that was a piece that, that made me some fame because I wound up singing with uh, Steve Inskeep about that famous song about Maury Eels. You know that song? When an eel bites your leg and the pain makes you beg, that's a Maury. <laughs> And we, yeah, thank you. And I think that's quite enough, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks very much. You know, I, I was fascinated by the story about the turtles, because when I think about half shells, I always think about oysters in the restaurant. <laughs> but anyway, before we take questions, I would like... Uh, you to join me in thanking Susan Marty. I don't know where she is now, but she's the one who organizes these lectures, takes care that everything is, happens properly, including the reception you will have afterwards. And she works very hard at it, and normally she's the one who introduces the speaker, but she allowed me to do it today. So thank you, Susan, wherever you are. She's probably watching. <laughs> She's probably watching the drinks and the, and the sweets that you are going to get. And now, please, let us have questions. Sure, yes. The splinter lady. Which is interesting, because I did hear your ancient turtle, but I didn't recognize it by that title. You said the half-shell guy, maybe I would have. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, people always have to. Well, uh, it, it, well, no, no, I mean, it's a fair question. I'm not trying, I'm, I'm not trying to, um, so, it, it, it really depends. I think at one time, when I was younger and more energetic, I was doing two or three stories a week, three or four sometimes. Um, now I'm in meetings a lot. <laughs> Uh, it's strange. I, I don't know why. I, it seems somehow my productivity has declined, but my meetings have gone up. Um, the answer is that uh, if I'm if I'm just uh, if I'm not involved in some special project, I would say two or three a week. But what's happened in the last year to me, for me is that um, is that I've just I've been sucked into some major projects, um, and those just tend to take longer. And you know, again. I, can I put in a plug here? So, so if any of you get a chance, there's a new science program on uh, NPR called Radio Labs, and um, it's just brilliant, right? It's just brilliant. It, it combines music and language and science and all sorts of things. But they sp they only do six stories a year, six shows a year, and they spend you know they spend two months and as much extra time as they can squeeze out on each one. And, you know, we talk about the fact, the, that turtle story, um, I did two stories the week leading up to New Year, uh, to Thanksgiving that week, because there was a news shortage. A lot of people were going on vacation. And so they said, you know, we'll take it. And that's, I love, I live for those times because I don't have to, you know, first of all, they know they'll get something that they, they can throw on the air from me. I'm, I'm not going to do something that, that they just won't use. But second of all, um, those are times when I can take a little liberty and just talk about about things that appeal to me. And that's why, the, like the Maury Eel. The Maury Eel, paper and science, set of pharyngeal jaws that reach out and grab. I mean, come on, you know, you're talking. It's a great story, very visual. So it's fun to do. Um, and... and uh, but, yeah, that's the answer. It's about two or three a week. Um, but, again, if, if I did ten, I'm happy to say they'd probably take ten, although maybe they'd be bored after a while. But I like doing them. Yes? What's the size of your audience in the demographics? Um, well, the latest figures say that 
uh, our average weekly audience, t- cumulative, there's two ways they measure it. Cumulative, which is how many people listen to NPR in a week, that's about 26 million. Um, for any given quarter hour of morning edition, so that's if you, you know, how many people are listening at any given moment in the show, it's about a million and a half, two million in some cases. So those are the numbers. In terms of demographics, well, we're older. The, po- the listeners tend to skew older, so our median age is, you know, getting going up every year. That's, I'm hoping to asymptote, you know, me and NPR and our audience will all die at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, and they, tend, they tell us that politically it's a third, a third, a third, a third Republican, a third Democrat, a third Independent. I can't believe that, but <laughs> um, and 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 um, generally we drink more red wine and take more lattes. The listeners <laughs> uh, must have known that already. Yes, sir. Have you ever done any articles on the importance of nanoseconds? Nanoseconds. Yeah. No. New subject. <laughs> well, that's the. Uh, I mean, yes. That's the. What, what, what would. What would. What would you have. What would you say I should do? Well, so many scientists are concentrating on bringing time down of events to measurement in nanoseconds that we're losing sight of the larger picture. I see. So you you would say that we should stop at femtoseconds? No. <laughs> uh, interesting. It's. It's an interesting point. Yes? Do you go right for the uh, New York Times science section once a week? Do I know? The articles in there, although they're in the science, are are very easily read Mm -hmm. and understood. And and that's a joy in that that, that part of the paper. Yeah. Uh, No, I mean, interestingly enough, in in a personal sense, when I was in graduate school and thinking about getting into journalism, uh, a fellow graduate student in psychology had gone through the same program the year before I did and uh, recommended me for the program. And she, for a number of years, wrote for the science page in the New York Times. Uh, the Times and I did a, a sort of a court, courtship dance at one point. Um, um, uh, it never, we, we never made it happen. So <laughs> I'm, I haven't done a lot of print writing because, because um, I feel that there's some quality in the human voice. Uh, my voice, partly because you can tell when I'm interested and excited. I mean, I can bring energy to a radio story with my voice that I'm not as clear how to do with my writing, right? I can use my voice to capture people's attention. And I think you can also have scientists. And I remember one time, well, my favorite cut of tape, although it didn't sound so great to me when I listened to it years later, but the, the vice president for research at Johns Hopkins University, I got him on the phone um, the day that the Office of Protection from Research Risks, which was the oversight for all human clinical trial research in the United States, shut Hopkins down, stopped all clinical trials, according to him, and and probably mostly accurately, because they had failed to do proper paperwork. And he was, I mean, he was livid, livid. And you could hear it in his voice. I mean, now, they may have been wrong. They may have done something wrong. But to hear his voice and to hear him shaking with anger is just not something, I couldn't have written it because it would have been an editorial judgment, but you could hear it. And I think there's something very appealing to that quality that radio brings to, broad, to reporting. Yes? Um, you do have a wide variety of topics that you talk about mm-hmm. on NPR. How do you identify something to talk about? How do you find something like right. a triple half shell? And once you identify it, how much time does it take to actually develop the story? Well, I mean, okay, so the turtle half shell is a, is a good example. Um, science reporters, well, first of all, we're flooded with suggestions. I mean, public relations firms, universities, 
I mean, every university in America has a public relations, any research university has a public affairs office that will send me, this is our latest research about this, that, or the other thing. To make a sort of a first pass, journalists tend to look at the top tier journals in science, science, nature, cell, PLOS now, New England Journal of Medicine, and the journals and the and the journalists have got this interesting. Do you all, does everybody know what an embargo is? So what happens is I get my copy of Science Magazine electronically on Monday morning, and I can read everything that's in the journal, and I can work on all the stories, but I can't broadcast them until 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. That's the deal. The deal is I get the story, I get to see the journal early but I can't publish until the embargo lifts. What that does is it gives me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning to track down the author of the paper, and the journal often helps with that, but also the people who, who know about the work. So in the, and nature is the same way. So this was the turtle paper was in, in nature, in the table of contents, and they also do a little press release describing, you know, just a couple lines on what each story is about. I saw that. Now, why did I cover that? It, it intrigued me. Because to tell the truth, we, we, we go through the journals every week, and I tell you, the discussion in the editorial discussion is, are there any must-do stories? And by must-do stories, what I mean is the kind of story that everybody else is going to do. Because I would argue that there are no must-do stories. I mean, I don't think there's a single journal article that I can think of this year you know, that was a must-do. Maybe in medicine, when you say cancer rates are going down in the United States after so many years of going up, that comes close to the kind of must-do kind of information. But the stuff in Science Magazine, it could be nonsense in a year. Why is it a must-do? Anyway, so after that, I, I, I think that just, that just goes to my conceit about the fact that science works incrementally, and it's, no, it's, no, it's nothing about the quality of the science that it turns out to be wrong. <laughs> it just, so after that, I say, well, once you've made the decision that nothing has to be done, that, the flip side of that is anything can be done because it's all interesting. So I saw, I saw the paper in Nature. That was um, Monday morning. Nature has a section that they call News and Views, which is an editorial, it's sort of a commentary about the paper that they publish along with the paper. So you can talk to the author of the paper, Reeple, because I didn't want to try the Chinese because I didn't think they'd work on radio. And, sorry, it's a factor. And the guy who wrote the News and Views was this guy named Rice. And Rice wasn't really very good. And I hadn't talked to Reeple, but when I was talking to Rice, I was trying to tell him, this poem I wanted to read on the air about the turtle. Does everybody know this poem about the turtle? The turtle lives twixt plated decks, which practically conceals its sex. I think it clever of the turtle in such a fix to be so fertile. <laughs> so I read him that poem and he went, oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. He said, you should talk to Gene Gaffney. And I said, who's Gene Gaffney? He said, oh, he's a very funny guy. He's at the uh, Museum of, American Museum of Natural History. So with the strength of he might find my poem funny, <laughs> I called Gene Gaffney. And Gaffney really, I mean, he really, uh, he really liked his, he was very, you know, direct. I like what he said. But, but when he said to me, oh, this could be the most important thing in turtle <laughs> research in the last 40 or 50 years, I just... It just it just cracks me up. Yeah, it could could be. Wow. Hold on everybody. Big story about turtle research. That's it, it, it's not even, I mean, I guess it's, it's not even making fun. It's just, it's just so intense that you get involved in the subject. And, and I thought he was great. And so I asked him if he had heard the turtle story, the turtle poem, and he said, yes, too many times. <laughs> <laughs> so it stopped right there. But that story went from Monday morning at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock to on the air Wednesday night at, you know, it was finished at 4 or three or something like that. And it was interviewing Gene Gaffney, interviewing Rice, uh, Robert Rice, and interviewing Oliver Reeple, listening to the tape, 
and then structuring the piece. And again, my idea is, you know, stunning news from the world of turtle paleontology. <laughs> What kind, of, what kind of nonsense is that? Who would write a sentence like that? But they let me do it. Yeah. Um, interestingly, most of the stories are straight science, but many stories in science have a political overtone, positive or negative. Mm-hmm. How do you balance that? Well, uh, uh, okay, balance maybe is the word I should focus on. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't believe, uh, in, like in the sense, uh, so so the, here's the classic balances. When I started in journalism, which is now getting on 25 years ago, when you did a story about the dangers of smoking, you balanced that with somebody from the Tobacco Institute who would tell you it's not proven. We don't, that, that's gone, right? Similarly, I mean, even before, I mean, well before the, the Supreme Court decision on creation science, there's not a balance between scientists who think there's an evolution, that you know, Darwin's evolution by natural selection is the most likely explanation for how things appeared on this planet and some other explanation that's based on faith. That's not balance. That's two different things, right? So if I'm going to do a political story that says, should we teach this or should we not teach this, that's balance. That's political. But it's not a science story. So I say, if you want a science story, I do the science story. If you want a political story, I'll do a political story, but let's not, let's not say it's anything else. There is no debate in the science community. So that's why I say, how do I balance it? I don't in the science world. When there are overtones, look, the, the place I got into this a lot in the last decade is stem cell research. Stem cell research, in my opinion, was completely oversold because, I mean, because, this is my theory, I don't have any, I don't have any proof of this, but because scientists were told, you may not do this. And they were forced into a situation of saying, this is so important, you've got to be crazy not to let us do this. I mean, they didn't say, I don't agree with you. I mean, they did that too. But they should have stopped there because it's perfectly all right for me to say, I don't believe that an embryo that's going to be discarded, that's created as part of a fertility process, has any rights as a human being, and therefore I should be allowed to study it. But they had to add on to that. And besides, we might cure diseases, and you're killing people by not letting us study that? Oh, give me a break. Similarly, when, you know, when the Repub- the, the, some of the members of Congress who were opposed to talked about dismembering embryos, that's such a great image to me because the only embryos I've ever seen are these blastocysts. I never saw a member, a member on a blastocyst. And so they're creating images. Everybody's trying to get the moral high ground here by saying it's not destroying embryos, it's saving lives of poor people with diseases. So I tried very hard to say I'm not going to get sucked into that. There's research, which is promise. There's moral objections, which say it's not, if you, you, you know, I mean, at some level, I mean, it's just, if you believe that destroying an embryo is a murder, there's no further argument. You're not allowed to destroy embryos? You're not allowed to. I mean, forgive me, I'll give you my political stance. When George Bush said in August 9, 2001, look, I'm opposed to destroying embryos for embryonic stem cell research, but look, there's some that have already been destroyed, and so let's use them. And I call that the no use crying over spilt milk school of moral philosophy. <laughs> because if it was immoral to do it, it was immoral to do it, and you shouldn't do the research on them. And he should have said no embryonic stem cell research will be funded with federal funds. But he, he did, he's amazing to me because he said, no, it's okay for them, they're already dead. <laughs> And that was the whole issue with the Nuremberg, you know, work that was done immorally can't be used in research. Anyway, I just, I didn't, I didn't understand that. I, I, I don't, and I'm, okay, so here, I'm giving you my personal opinion. I don't have the problem of an embryo being a human being. So it, but I don't do that research. That's okay. <clears throat> but I thought it was morally inconsistent 
of the administration to take the position they took, and I'm much more comfortable with the, you know, the College of Bishops uh, and those guys who said it's wrong, we shouldn't do it, it's wrong. But then you get into the whole thing of well, in vitro fertilization should be banned. I mean, I, I can get with that. I, it's banned in some places, and fine. There's no law that says you should be allowed to create embryos that you're going to subsequently destroy. <coughs> so the answer to your question is I try to stick, I try not to get swept into the political overtones, even though I know they're there. I think my job is to rattle people's cages. I mean, scientists tried to say, well, we don't want you to call it cloning. Because, you know, because they were talking about cloning an embryo and they didn't want people to be confused about cloning a dolly the sheep and cloning. I'm sorry. It's, it's the word. I mean, you know, I, it's the word. You can't get away with, you can't skirt the problem by changing the language. There's dessert out there. Anybody else have a question? 